Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. I'm your host, Bill Potter. Once again, State Senator Mark Mesmer joins us in the studio to kind of bring us up to date on what's happened in legislation and uh, bills that you have been involved yep. in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got some really good news on one of your bills, and, and you've got three more bills that are just kind of chomping at the bit. That's to get right, going. getting close. So uh, total this, this week we passed 25 House bills on final passage. Uh, all of them were bipartisan, 14 were unanimous, which wow. statistically that... And 18 Senate bills that we had changes in the, in the House came back. Uh, 16 were bipartisan and 11 were unanimous. So I got a, got a lot done on the floor this week. And one of the bills that I had sponsored, I worked on with Representative McNamara out of at Mount Vernon. And uh, it's House Bill 1199. Um, and, and what it does, uh, it allows drivers who, who the number one traffic uh, violation in terms of sheer numbers is driving without a license. Uh, and uh, there's 850,000 people out of the 1.2 million people that have suspended licenses that it's, it's, uh, they're suspended just because of lack of insurance. Uh, it was a two-year work group with the Indiana Prosecutors Association, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, the uh, Insurance Institute, uh, Department of Corrections, and the Public Defenders Council all, you know, all worked on getting the framework you know, together to where everybody was uh, you know, satisfied with, with the process. But it allow folks who have a suspended license, I mean, currently you have to pay all your back due fees and then maybe you have a, a missed court date because you didn't have a license. And, and I mean, there, it just, a, a, you know, things just kept stacking up on top of each other. So this will allow you to come up with a repayment plan, you know, go to, go to the, the BMV, set up a repayment plan, prove that you've got insurance and you can get it in six month increments and then your license will, you know, will get reinstated. Keep your insurance in place, and and but if any time in that six month period, if you drop your insurance, the suspension goes back into place uh, immediately. So it will. It, they they call this a, a a crime of poverty rather than a crime mm -hmm. of you know. I mean something. I mean more or less, it's low income folks that just get trapped in that cycle. And then that cycle just keeps keep continuing because it keeps getting building. amplified. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and also through this process, they're going to set up a program. Where the when folks come out of the Department of Corrections, as long as they're a nonviolent offender, they'll be they'll be qualified for this program as well. And, and they they get out of DOC and and, and BMV is going to work with DOC to come up with the, the rule process of you know of how it'll get set up. But they'll be able to come out of DOC with their driving privileges reinstated. They don't have to pay the reinstatement fee if they work through, keep themselves employed either in a work training program or employed for three years and keep your insurance paid. And then at the end of that three year period, the reinstatement fee that they would get assigned gets forgiven. So allow folks coming out of DOC, I mean, driving to work is, is you know, pretty much a requirement for almost everybody that works. I mean, you know, few people could walk to work uh, and, and not having the ability to get, you know, to legally drive, I mean, that, that's a, that's a big stumbling block for folks, especially folks coming out of DOC. So trying to help uh, streamline the process, get them working uh, pro productively, and, and get people out of that trap of the never-ending cycle of suspended license, driving on a license, failure to appear. Just, and, and I think the failure to appear has is, is also been reduced to the same uh, lack of financial responsibility uh, uh, infraction uh, instead of it being a higher level infraction for not appearing for lack of insurance. It, it's it's going to help minimize the impact of, of that as well. So, but does it only apply to um, driving without a license, or is it also just, some of those driving without insurance? Or? Just drive, driving without insurance. Okay. Is okay. is I mean financial lack of financial responsibility. And that's that's what this bill. Yep. Okay. Yep. So passed out of the House unanimously, passed out of the Senate unanimously, and, and is now down on the governor's desk for signature. And when he signs it, when will this become law? July 1st. July 1st, okay, this yep. is one of those that goes. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Then you have three bills that you have worked on that yep. are sitting in committee, but if they don't get out of that committee by the, next week, Thursday. Thursday is the final day, okay. um, April 8th. That's the cutoff for committee work, so you better get it out or it's dead. <laughs> okay. Well, what are those three bills that we so, need to watch for? Yep. House Bill 1002, which was, um, I had it in committee three weeks. So that's the bill that, that does a little, uh, Senate Bill 1 was the COVID immunity just for transmitting the, the disease person to person. House Bill 1002 is, is uh, an enhancement to that, that 
that hospitals and doctors and nursing homes felt like they needed because there were so many rule changes that they had to deal with and, and, and in doctors' cases and hospitals, you know, where they were told by the, by the state, you can't do elective procedures. We had it in the spring, we had it in December. And issues dealing with, you know, dealing with COVID, you know, in the medical setting. And it was a pretty extensive process of working with the, the folks in the medical side, the, the trial lawyers, and coming up with the right language to, to make sure the trial lawyers felt like they weren't, you know, blocked from pursuing, you know, things that might have been, um, you know, egregious uh, malpractice mm -hmm. in a hospital setting or, or just negligence in a nursing home. So, you know, making sure all of the, the wording was, was very precisely, you know, covered to give the protection where they needed it, but not give undue protection for, for things that might be uh, egregious. So that got out of committee. Uh, on Wednesday uh, on a uh, nine to one vote. So one guy just didn't get a chance to read it ahead of time. I think I'll probably be able to get him to support it on the floor. <laughs> um, House Bill 1123, an interesting bill got out of committee this week, deals with urban agriculture. And uh, so that'll be one where if you have a, like a half acre or acre lot in a you know urban or inner city setting, you can get a property tax exemption for allowing that to be used for urban agriculture. So folks can have like neighborhood uh, neighborhood gardens, community garden, garden, or, community oh, gardens. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So that that got out uh, unanimously this week, and look forward to ushering that through the final process next week. And House Bill 1381, and it didn't get a lot of attention down here because it's not. I mean, you know, uh, the wind energy folks tend to, to draw the most attention, but it it's a uniform uh, uh, setback standards bill was the base bill. Uh, but there was a lot of a lot of pushback from you know from especially counties in northern Indiana that you know some of them have very restrictive ordinances on on wind or some ban it completely, and so there was a lot of a lot of uh, resistance to you know to how the bill left the house. So I worked with local government folks, worked with the wind wind and solar energy folks to really uh, it, it still has the 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 basic framework of of uniform siting standards if your county doesn't have you know zoning currently, but if you have uh, zoning that it, that applies to to uh, renewable energy now. It gives it gives the, those counties the option of creating a renewable energy district, you know, within the within the within the county, not allow it to be countywide, but but allow it in a in a you know, more narrow area, <clears throat> and then gives an incentive for counties. You know, if they adopt that renew renewable energy district, they can uh, the the renewable company would would. You know, it, they would have to come to agreement on the zone and and, and uh, the details of it, but they would have a three thousand dollar per megawatt of generating generating capacity that goes toward the either the neighbors of the renewable energy project or re redevelopment within that renewable energy zone. So try to make it more of an incentive than a demand, and that really got a great response. Got it out of committee on Thursday morning, and a lot of work with renewable companies and and local government folks to to get that one narrowed down to be uh, much more palatable for everybody. Now these are out of committee. Out of committee. So that means they'll go on the floor for mm -hmm. vote. Next then they'll week. go to the House. Uh, is since that, I, or is one of them? Uh, yeah, um, they've all had changes, so they'll all go back to the House. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the urban agriculture one was just minor technical changes, mm -hmm. but uh, just some commas in the wrong place kind of stuff. But And th this renewable energy one, mm -hmm. um, Around our area, I guess that would be mostly probably solar. Primarily solar. Not much here. wind. No, so. you, we're not in a really. We would be way out of the wind. You know, good wind zone. Mm -hmm. You have to get up to elevations where central northern Indiana have to be, in in the the wind tunnel uh, that comes off the Great Plains. But so the western edge of of the state is is usually good, and then from Indianapolis north, is kind of where that wind wind corridor uh, normally sets. But it would still have some standards that, that could be adopted, you know, for counties, you know, for solar as well. Uh, I don't think any of the counties in our area have have any zoning for for solar at this point. And but this would this would you know would set up uniform standards for folks that don't have it. I mean, you know, I, our commissioners were were fine with the bill as, as it was drafted. It left the house just because we currently don't have any policies in place, and, and they were satisfied with how the original draft was set up. But folks in nor northern Indiana, it got their attention. So worked with them to get it in a good spot. Does this have to do with like what if I want to put solar panels on my home? Is that a separate kind of separate, thing? That's a little yeah, small. Yeah, sort not of not, thing. Im, not impacted by this at all. It, it only kicks into projects that are 10 megawatts and bigger. Okay. Which would be a pretty large, you know, solar array like the one the one in Huntingburg, mm -hmm. I think right. is a one megawatt. 
Oh, really? Okay. So they have to be. Okay. So you have to be pretty big. Have to be pretty big to, to kick in okay. to be a to be considered a commercial installation. Okay. Neat idea to share it with the neighbors. Yes. The neighborhood. I, I like that. Yep. Okay. So. Good week at the State House. Good week for you at the State House, and uh, hopefully it'll continue next week. And, and uh, then next thing we know, we'll be talking budget. That's right. We'll that, see how, and that'll how be that that'll pop out of committee next Thursday. All so. right. Well, Senator, thank you very much for coming You're in. You're welcome. Appreciate you taking the time great today. To yep, great to be here. Our guest has been State Senator Mark Mesmer. He represents you. If you'd like to contact him, contact him either uh, through email or you can phone call him. But we certainly appreciate you coming in. My pleasure. Great to be here. Thank you for watching 18WJTS. We are local people watching local people.